It's a tale as old as time itself. Wrestler rises up, gets over, WWE didn't want to book it that way, so have them fall back down to wherever on the card they would like them to be. It's nuts when you think about it, why wouldn't you want as many performers resonating with the crowd as possible, but we've seen it happen so many times you have to at the very least assume it does go on. How that means anybody's supposed to get anywhere I don't know, but that may be the mystery that Evolution was singing about. It's not like this is new either or a one-off, it's a constant and may have clipped some people's wings long before they would have crashed into the ground. It's almost like they'd have been better not doing anything at all and waiting for a different opportunity. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 7 Wrestlers WWE Punished for getting over. Number 7 Fandango Chris Jericho was meant to fight right back at WrestleMania 29 in a match which was going to help the big guy get more over than he already was. It would have worked. Jericho was a star and losing to him on the biggest show of the year meant something. And from nowhere, Vince McMahon changed his mind. Fandango, who had been dancing down entrance ways, was the new pick and in a move that shocked everybody, he won. Served Y2J right for never properly learning his name disrespectful so-and-so. This sparked something because on the following night's Raw, the crowd spent the entire time singing Fandango's theme music in what undoubtedly took him to a new level. Where it could actually go was anybody's guess, but still, on paper at least, the real-life Johnny Curtis was ahead of where he was meant to be. Fandangoing became a thing overnight and here in the UK, the track almost broke into the top 40 music chart, which is ridiculous. It was like the early 90s all over again. WWE didn't care for this though and decided the song was more over than the man himself and they had him lose to Jericho at the next pay-per-view. They then slowly moved him back down the card and hoped that nobody noticed. It worked, and before we knew it, it was as if none of this had even happened at all. Number 6, Damien Sandow Damien Sandow was an oddity in WWE. The intellectual saviour of the masses gimmick had legs which was proven when he was the Money in the Bank winner. From there, however, it was like a character assassination. Breaking the usual run of people becoming champ after getting the briefcase, he fell so fast it was like he had insulted Vince McMahon personally. He was given comedy character after comedy character, including impersonating Hugh Jackman on Raw. I mean, what was that? The nail in this coffin would surely come when he was partnered with The Miz and told he had to be his stunt double. That could never work, but that wasn't the case. Sandow, or Mizdow, started to get crazy reactions from the crowd as he imitated The Miz move for move, and before long he was far more popular than his positioning on the card. It all built to the Andre the Giant battle roar at WrestleMania 31, where the only thing fans wanted to see was Sandow fight back against The Miz, throw him out and win the thing. WWE got half of that right. He did the first bit as fans roared their approval, but then was dumped out by the big show, something no one wanted. At all. We never got a proper feud between the actor and his so-called underling, and instead, Sandow became an afterthought as he tooled away doing nothing before finally walking away from the company entirely. The frustrating thing is that it could have been so much more, but it simply wasn't part of the plan. And when you're not part of the plan, it doesn't matter what position you fall into, the Sword of Damocles is waiting. Number 5, Bad News Barrett Cody Rhodes was ahead of the game in 2013 and already showing the forward-thinking nature which five years later would see him be in charge of his own company. What a world. Not overly happy with how he was being used on TV, he became a regular on the JBL and Cole YouTube show and pretty much stole every scene he was in. If he wasn't allowed to do it on the big screen, he would do it here instead. Others caught on to this idea, including one Wade Barrett, who soon became Cody's right-hand man and the bearer of bad news. He was so good with it he caught wind of the right people and the gimmick was promoted to the main roster. Surprise, surprise, it was also a success there. Barrett launched himself into it with so much gusto you couldn't help, if nothing else, find it damn entertaining and that's because it was. Clearly Vinnie Mac hadn't seen these skits beforehand because as soon as it started to receive big reactions from the crowd, Barrett was told to tone it down because he was meant to be a heel. How crazy is that? Organically get some momentum only for it to be torn down like a tree. To make matters worse, this was soon replaced with the King Barrett gimmick where he had to carry around a scepter and wear a crown and when you throw in the League of Nations, it was almost like Wade was in the doghouse because he did a good job. Anybody else surprised he left? No, me neither. Number 4, Daniel Bryan You can't really say that WWE punished or buried Daniel Bryan too much. The end of all of this faff was an amazing world title win at WrestleMania, which we will all talk about until someone tells us to shut up. Even then, we'll just go and find someone else who would like to hear the story. But it is clear that for a while, WWE did do all they could to try and curb Bryan's crazy swell of popularity with the crowd. It all started at Mania 28 in many ways, when Sheamus booted Bryan's head off and took his championship away in 18 seconds. That's not not what fans wanted to see and started to back the yes man as if he were one of their own. From there, 
Forget about it. Even a tag team with Kane, which surely was meant to be a distraction, got over like crazy, and an ill-fated attempt at turning him heel barely lasted a week. Brian fought back against the Wyatt family almost as soon as he joined them, and even that somehow made him more beloved. The situation was clear, Danny Boy could come out on TV and just sit there, and everybody would still lose their minds. We all knew what we wanted to see. Fans stepped in once again when Batista got booed during his return, leaving WWE with only one option, do what the audience wanted. What a concept. They did and it was wonderful and arguably as of right now, the best babyface ending to the show of shows we've had ever since. It made you feel good and that is always the point. Number three, Rusev Day. Something that genuinely keeps me up at night, I do not understand why Rusev Day were treated like they were. A good trio who were gaining momentum, which also finally opened up an avenue for the Bulgarian brute to show what he was capable of, the real joy was their daft catchphrase, which was also their name. Every day was Rusev Day, and therefore a celebration was always on the cards. It seemed like the idea from the off was just to break them up despite the love from fans growing every week. A lengthy tag title reign was surely the least they deserved, and yet the opposite is what we got. Aiden English turned on his partner, made up an affair with his wife, and after one 10 second match on SmackDown, they went their separate ways. Right. It was what happened afterwards that was odder still. English disappeared from TV altogether and Rusev was handed the US belt for three seconds and then returned to being a heel. It was like the last few months hadn't happened and at no point were the fans' roars met with any kind of response. We just ticked on forward to see what may happen and then nothing happened. This wasn't a punishment of sorts but it was not taking advantage of a situation that could have been far bigger than it is now. For example, Ruru hasn't won on pay-per-view for two years as of me saying these words. The fact he's still relevant at all is proof of his staying power. Can we just give him a proper chance now, please? Thanks. Number two, Cesaro. Not only a constant winner of the Wrestling Observer's most underrated award, but also finding himself at the end of Vince McMahon's brass ring speech on Stone Cold's podcast, there was an essence of hope for Cesaro in 2014. As crowd support slowly built thanks to the Swiss Superman's in-ring acumen and giant swing, WWE removed him from the Real Americans team and made him the winner of the first ever Andre the Giant Battle Royal. There was potential here to strike, and as it was the inaugural version of the multi-man brawl, surely WWE would let Cesaro talk about this until he was blue in the face. Not quite. Despite being paired with Paul Heyman on the following night's Raw, someone made the decision to calm all this down because it was getting too popular. The swing, for example, was removed from his arsenal, and after the fact it transpired that he was only put with Heyman to keep Brock Lesnar's advocate on TV. Cesaro started to get pinned left, right, and center, and his big win at WrestleMania was barely mentioned. It was a proper 180 with no real explanation given, and of course today he finds himself in the bar. They're pretty good, but it was still an odd path that took him here. And oh, what could and maybe should have been. Number one, Zack Ryder. In a role I'm sure he's not overly keen on, Zack Ryder has become the poster boy for someone getting themselves over and then suffering because of it on the other end. Buying into the idea that you have to make your own success, Ryder jumped on board with the YouTube revolution and smashed it out the park. His Z True Island Long Story channel drew tons of followers and more importantly endeared Ryder to the masses as he continued to be both entertaining and honest. Before long this had transferred to live crowds as they continually chanted for the man, even when the Rock stood in the ring after Survivor Series in 2011. WWE had no choice but to do something and finally gave him the United States Championship, but it was far from what many had hoped. One, that bell wasn't exactly shining bright back then, and two, he was never given a proper run with it anyway. Aside from no major matches, he was also dumped by his girlfriend Eve Torres who wanted to date John Cena, and Ryder during this time kept getting beaten up by Kane. The big red machine even threw him off the stage while he was in a wheelchair. That sums it all up. Ryder fell foul to this eventually when fans realized we weren't going to get what we wanted, but even now he still gets a decent response when he arrives on the scene, even though he's rarely on TV. He made an impact and then was thrust into a brick wall. He is back on Raw at the moment as I do say these words as he re-teams with Kurt Hawkins, and given that I like Kurt Hawkins too, I'm going to keep everything crossed that maybe, just maybe, this is finally where Zack Ryder gets his due. I mean, it would only be a tag team title win, but I'd be alright with that right now, because let's face it, what else does he get? If you don't know, he even got replaced in the Raw Rumble by Kurt Angle, and while I can understand that, it still sucked that day to be Zack Ryder, and that in itself sucks. Know of any other WWE superstars that got punished for getting over? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com and read yourself some articles, and follow What Culture on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. My name is Simon from WhatCulture, and I will talk to you again soon.